uh, troll climate and drought outlook. Uh, it's uh, for January. Um, Trent Ford, the Illinois State Climatologist, will be giving the presentation. And I just want to remind folks, if you uh, if you have any questions as we go along, you can pose them in the question box. There's a question uh, area to put that. Uh, sometimes we can get to those as we go, uh, but but if if there's time at the end, we'll try to get to all the questions one way or the other um, with our panel. Uh, Dennis Toddy from USDA is on as well. So um, please, if you have any any questions or comments, actually, you can put them in the question question boxes in there. So we'll we'll watch those as we go. And why don't you take it away, Trent? Because I think we have a lot to cover this time. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Uh, so as Doug mentioned, uh, my name is Trent Ford. I'm the Illinois State Climatologist here at the State Water Survey. It's part of the University of Illinois. Um, and uh, uh, welcome to the Central Region Climate and Drought Outlook. Okay, so um, just some general information to start things off. Um, just a, a list of some collaboration uh, as these webinars are between USDA Climate Hubs, um, Midwest and High Plains Regional Climate Centers, NOAA, National Weather Service, National Drought. Center. Um, and then uh, this and past webinars can be found at these two links at both regional climate centers for the region. Uh, and just a heads up, the next month, uh, another important month, February, uh, the next webinar will be held on Thursday, February 18th, and it'll be Dr. Becky Bollinger, uh, Assistant State Climatologist at uh, Colorado State University. Okay, real quick outline on what we're going to be covering today. As Doug mentioned, there's quite a bit considering it's the first, uh, first month of the year. So we're going to do some recent climate conditions, uh, review December as well as 2020 as a year, um, and then go through uh, more recently the last 60 and 90 days of things that have been going on in the region, uh, go through some hydrology, uh, snow, soils, and stream flow, a drought being a big topic right now in the region, so we're going to cover that, as well as current conditions in the Great Lakes, cover some impacts, and then we'll look at outlooks, uh, short-term, long-term, seasonal, as well as ENSO outlooks and uh, we'll wrap it up from there. Okay, so let's start with some recent climate conditions, what we've been seeing from December and, and the year of 2020 as a whole. So uh, as a December climate review, what we're looking at here are, are maps of state rankings for December, temperature on the left and precipitation on the right. For temperature, the left map, the higher the number, the higher the ranking of December average temperature uh, based on uh, 126 years of record going back to 1895. Uh, what we saw was that pretty much across the northern half of the United States, and especially in our region here, uh, December was very warm. Top 10 warmest December on record in Montana, both Dakotas and Nebraska, um, but still well above average across most of the Midwest and the Plains. To switch over to precipitation on the, the right-hand side, the precipitation map here, the, the higher the number, the wetter the conditions. So you can see most states are either in white, which is near average December precipitation, or in the yellowish, orangish, which is uh, slightly to very dr much drier than average. Uh, so it was, it was drier than average in most states in our region, um, but not anomalously so. Certainly the, the, the temperature anomaly was really the, the, the big um, uh, news out of December. And that really kept with patterns that we saw from, from November as well, which was also very, very warm. So uh, similar maps here, only this is showing 2020 overall as an annual, as, a, as an entire year. This is just showing temperature, these maps are. On the left is, again, state rankings. And what we're seeing is that every single state in the lower 48 had, were, was warmer than average uh, in, uh, um, in, in 2020. And some were very much so. Uh, so, for example, uh, 2020 was, was warmer than average every single state in our region. Uh, and the top 10 warmest in both Ohio and Michigan. Um, when we look at the lower 48 states as a whole, uh, 2020 was the fifth warmest year on record for the contiguous US. Um, and so, so very warm overall uh, for the entire region. And that's really been par for the course uh, in most regions of the U.S., including our, our north central U.S. region here. What I'm showing is uh, here is annual average temperature across the entire region from Kentucky up to Montana um, uh, going back to 1895. And the blue line shows a that, that warming trend over that 126-year period, that trend about 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. And so 2020 is just part of this long-term increasing temperature trend 
uh, over the region where we are getting warmer as a region. Now, if we break this down between minimum temperature and maximum temperature, both are increasing, but minimum temperature is the dominant driver, as it was this year where our minimum temperature anomalies were uh, quite a bit larger than our maximum temperature anomalies were. And then 2020 uh, overall precipitation, you see this huge difference between the eastern U.S. in the green and blue, where we have very, very wet conditions for the year of 2020, and the western U.S. where it was very dry. So 2020 was extremely wet in the southeast U.S., actually the second wettest on record in, New in North Carolina, but very dry as we move west. Uh, the driest year on record actually in Nevada and Utah, as you see those dark brown there. Top 10 driest year on record in North Dakota and Wyoming, and, uh, and uh, Colorado was the second driest on record, uh, um, coming only after 2002. And actually for Colorado, the top three driest years on record statewide have been 2002, 2012, and 2020. So, so three of the last 20 years uh, have been the top three driest uh, for the state of Colorado. If we move east, it's a little bit of a different story. Uh, the top 10 wettest on record was last year in Kentucky. Um, but overall, when we think about especially the high plains in the western part of the region, it was very dry. And that's actually been quite a contrast to the last couple of years. Actually, if we go back 18 months from now going back to 2018, we actually see that um, that, uh, that that period of time was still overall very wet, uh, much wetter than normal than the long term average. And, and so really the, this, this last year represented a pretty big flip. Uh, in conditions for most of that high plains and, and, and uh, um, eastern Rockies region. For example, Sioux Falls in South Dakota, the station there, they had their second wettest year on record in 2018, their wettest year on record in 2019, and then 2020 was their sixth driest, and their record is going back to 1893. Bismarck had a similar pattern, 2019 was the second wettest, 2020 was the third driest, so, so quite a big change in that region. Now, 2020 was also a, 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 a pretty active weather year. Uh, I think the, the, the leading headlines here is the wildfires in Colorado and the derecho in the Midwest. Uh, first, the wildfires. Um, I'm showing you the, the figure on the right-hand side. It's from the Colorado Sun. It's showing the, the bars here. The yellow bars are the number of acres burned by wildfire in Colorado each year since 2002. And you can see this last year had the most acres by quite a bit. However, interestingly, the line that's over the top of that, the, the dot, dot line shows a number of actual fires, and it was well below every single other year going back all the way to 2002. So actually, Colorado had this, had this odd pattern of very, uh, very few fires overall, but the fires they did have were very large and, and, and burned to an incredible amount of area uh, per fire. And of course, that, that uh, can be related back to very warm temperatures and, and, and overall dry conditions. Uh, here in the Midwest, we had the derecho for any, any folks who had forgotten uh, about that. Uh, uh, just some statistics from Iowa alone, $11 billion in um, insured costs so far in Iowa, 3.5 million acres of corn estimated, 2.5 million, million acres of beans destroyed just from that uh, storm alone, and uh, uh, some really significant specialty crop damage in Iowa as well from that. So that was definitely a, a significant event. Overall, when we look at the entire United States, we had 22 uh, natural disasters that, that cost $1 billion or more nationwide, which is the most on record um, by quite a bit, actually. Uh, some of those were severe storms across the region, as well as the derecho and the wildfires in, in Colorado. Okay, so a little bit more recently here, coming up to the, to the last 60 days, showing precipitation. On the left is showing a map of departure from normal in inches, and the right is a percent of normal. Uh, so most of the region has been about one to four inches drier than normal since November. Uh, so th this area here from south, southern Kansas up through uh, northern Missouri and, and southeast Ohio is, or excuse me, Iowa is the, uh, is the exception there. But most of the region has been uh, slightly to very dry over the last couple of months. We're looking at a percent of normal parts of the northern plains, including parts of South Dakota and Montana, have had less than 10 percent of normal precipitation over the last 60 days. Um, we should mention here, though, that, that even though those percent of normal, those reds can look pretty ominous, uh, in fact, this is uh, uh, normally climatologically uh, a pretty dry time of the year. So overall, um, you know, th these areas, the Dakotas that are at 10 percent of normal precipitation in the last 60 days really have a precipitation deficit of only about one inch or less than that. And so 
Um, you know, when thinking about times of the year when trying to make up soil moisture deficit as far as drought, this isn't really that time of the year to do that. Uh, although the, the, the dryness is noteworthy, especially again in the northwestern part of the region. Looking at 90 day patterns, again, uh, departure from normal on the left and a percent of normal on the right, very, very similar. Uh, some of the departures over the last three months uh, in the Midwest kind of uh, pick out from central Missouri through central Illinois all the way up to Michigan. That area uh, has a, a precipitation deficit since October of, of three to five inches, uh, which represents about 70 to 50 percent of normal. Um, uh, there are some areas, again, parts of North Dakota, Western Kansas that are at less than 25 percent of normal over the last 90 days. But again, this, this time period is typically pretty dry anyway for that part of the region. One of the biggest stories for winter so far has just been the, the how, how mild or anomalously warm the temperatures have been this season. So what I'm showing you here are the temperature departures in degrees Fahrenheit over the last 60 days. So going back to November here, um, talking about parts of the Dakotas and eastern Montana, temperature departures of 10 to 15 degrees. Um, virtually every part of the region has been warmer than average. Uh, over the last 60 days, and then we can extend that back to 90 days as well. Um, but uh, but some of these temperature departures, especially again in the northern plains, are, are really eye popping considering 10 to 15 days, and that's the average temperature. It's not just some sort of uh, a maximum temperature there. So very warm so far with uh, with winter temperatures this season. And of course, when we get winter air temperatures that are much warmer than average and and reduced snowpack, as I'll talk about in a little bit soil temperatures tend to follow suit. What I'm showing here is a map of, of four inch soil temperatures measured under sod across the, the central region here. And really we're only seeing stations in the northern half of North Dakota and eastern Colorado that are below freezing at four inches. Again, this is under sod, uh, um, but, uh, but still not a whole lot of widespread uh, four inch soil moisture or soil temperature measurements that are below freezing here. Um, further south across the Midwest, temperatures remain in the high 30s and in some places the lower 40s in the southern third of the region. One thing I want to make uh, clear, th this, this point here is, is, is a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, uh, an error reading there. We're not actually getting 90 degrees in Sykeston uh, right now, but uh, um, overall the region temp soil, moisture, soil temperatures are, are much warmer than average for this time of the year. Uh, and with that, frost depth is also uh, quite a bit below what we'd normally expect for this time of the year. Um, this is showing frost depths again from, from uh, across the eastern part of the region here. Uh, in most places, frost depths are ranging from, from uh, less than three inches to six to 12 inches. Um, pretty, you know, that zero to three inch mark for frost depth uh, ranges all the way from Paducah up to central Wisconsin and southern Minnesota. Those areas are seeing less than three inches of, of frost depth so far, which is quite a bit less than what would typically be expected. Uh, really only a handful of stations with uh, 18 or more inches of soil frost depth right now in um, mainly relegated to North Dakota and a couple in the upper peninsula of Michigan. This does a couple things. First of all, having not having deep soil frost does allow for a higher potential of infiltration with rainfall or snowfall, with the snowpack melts. Um, and, and that can that can help replenish soil moisture in parts of the region that we wouldn't expect a whole lot of soil moisture replenishment typically for this time of the year because typically we have deeper soil fr uh, frost. However, it also means that without that uh, that soil frost deeper at this point in the season and also with reduced snowpack, it increases the risk of, of quick soil frost depth fluctuations if we do get uh, a short term uh, fluctuations in our air temperature. So very cold air outbreak can affect soil temperatures a lot quicker uh, when, when we already have soil temperatures this warm and, uh, and, and reduce snowpack. To give you a, an idea of, of, of the climatology of where we're at with soil temperature, and this is kind of difficult to do because we don't have a whole lot of, of long-term climate stations that have been measuring soil temperature for a long time. One of the resources we do have in the region is the Illinois Climate Network, which has been measuring soil temperature under sod for, for over 30 years now. What I'm showing you here in this plot is January average four inch soil temperatures measured under sod uh, going back to 1989. This is from DeKalb in Northern Illinois. 
Uh, first of all, you can see a pretty distinct trend, upward trend in soil temperatures, which is, is, is pretty reminiscent for most of the Midwest where our soil temperatures in the wintertime are increasing. Uh, but overall, this time, this year, uh, our, our soil temperature of about 35 degrees Fahrenheit is the second highest for this time of the year in DeKalb, uh, only after 2012. If you think back to 2006 and 2012, the Januaries of those years were both warm and dry winters overall. Uh, in Illinois, especially, and so and so, this is reminiscent. When our soils are dry, the temperatures tend to fluctuate a little bit uh, more quickly than if we have uh, a lot of moisture in that soil. At the same time, because we don't have uh, the snowpack that we would typically have in parts like northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin, um, it means that our soil temperatures uh, fluctuate a little bit more rapidly with the air temperature. So I've, I've been kind of hinting at snowpack uh, for a little while. So let's talk about snowfall across the region. And this is showing departure from normal in the left-hand side, the right-hand side is percent of normal, going back to August 1st of last year. Um, I think the percent of normal tells a little bit of a, of a, of a better story here. Most of the upper Midwest and Eastern Corn Belt have had less than 75% of normal snowfall. Um, and, and actually the majority of the region uh, sands a couple of areas uh, in eastern Nebraska, for example, central Iowa, that have gotten a couple of uh, winter storms to drop some snow over there. Most of the region, especially the eastern half of the region, is well behind their typical snowfall by this time of the year. Um, parts of Illinois, for example, around the St. Louis area are less than 5% of normal. Now, we, I should mention here that that 5% of normal is still uh, uh, you know, about five to 10 inches less than normal. So one winter storm can make up for that. Uh, but that being said, most areas are behind uh, uh, on, their, on their total snowfall for the year. So really uh, anomalously high temperatures for the winter, uh, below average snowfall, and makes for what we consider a mild winter season so far. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, showing that here, trying to illustrate that with this map, which shows the uh, accumulated winter season severity index, or Aussie. Um, Aussie accumulates winter severity daily uh, based on how much snowfall, snow depth, and minimum maximum temperature measurements at, at each station. And, and overall, Aussie is really beneficial to represent the cumulative winter severity with respect to that historical record at that station. Uh, and so across this map here, every station in red is currently experiencing a climatologically mild winter season, which means the total severity of that winter season is less than the 20th percentile. And again, that's mostly driven by minimum temperature. We haven't seen consistent, persistent, uh, uh, very, very low minimum temperatures across the region. At the same time, we also haven't had that snowfall and the snow depth uh, hasn't really stuck around. The snowpack hasn't stuck around for as long as is, is typically expected. Uh, of note here also, stations at St. Louis, Lansing and Saginaw, Michigan and Concordia, Kansas are currently experiencing a record mild winter. Uh, and those records go back um, at least to the 1950s, if not beyond that. Okay, so we are pivot a little bit to, to hydrology. Talk about the meteorology, let's talk about hydrology conditions. Starting with, keeping with the snow theme here, uh, looking at snowpack as a, as a function of snow water equivalent here. On the left is current uh, today, uh, January 21st. And then just uh, for your uh, context here, on the right-hand side is, is this time last year with snowpack. So we have reduced snowpack across the entire region relative to last year, but also relative to our climatology. Big differences here, especially relative to last year in the Dakotas, where we're, we're essentially snow free for, for most of uh, the states of South and North Dakota, as well as Nebraska. Um, but also in areas where we do have snowpack, like northern Mi uh, Minnesota, for example, right now we're looking at, at anywhere between two and four inches of snow water equivalent here, whereas last year we were looking at eight to 12 inches of snow water equivalent. So overall, that reduced snowfall and higher temperatures has meant less water in that snowpack overall a lot more melting of that snow. And certainly as we look down in the Southern Midwest, uh, any sort of snow that's fallen down here has melted pretty immediately because of those temperatures. Uh, going out West to the mountains, uh, we see that uh, on, the, on the left hand side here, uh, looking at, at individual ba or, uh, basins here, uh, as a snow water equivalent as percent of normal. We're seeing that, that um, some, some important watersheds for the Missouri headwaters, including Missouri headwaters uh, uh, at 78% of, of normal snow water equivalent, both Platts, North Platte and South Platte at 70 and 75% of snow water equivalent right now. So kind of a similar uh, thing as what we're seeing farther east with, with below average snowpack. Again, 
uh, uh, mainly driven by those uh, very high temperatures for this time of the year, but also uh, the, the noticeable lack of, of frequent winter storms to bring that snowpack in. When we take a more west wide view of things, we do see that there are quite a few, in fact, most basins in Montana are at or slightly above uh, normal snowpack at those those green basins here, but further east and further south, if you get to Wyoming and Colorado, we're seeing a lot of those basins at anywhere between 50 and 80 percent of normal snow water equivalent for their snowpack. So overall, um, especially for for the, the headwaters in Missouri, we're, we're seeing um, below average snowpack for that area. Um, to to kind of put that in better perspective here with a chart, this is showing uh, mountain snowpack water content. Uh, as in inches of water equivalent uh, above Fort Peck on the left and then Fort Peck to Garrison on the right. Both are at 81% of normal. That, that, that 1981 to 2010 average to consider our normal period for right now uh, is shown here in the red line. You can see where we are in this blue plot here, 81% uh, of that normal. So, so behind for this time of the year, not uh, record breaking at this point, but, but still uh, behind the snowpack that we would normally see for this time of the year. And for the Platte River Basin, something similar, a little bit less uh, as far as snowpack is concerned, 69% uh, uh, North Platte and 66% South Platte, um, again, below that, uh, that, that, that 1981 to 2020 normal. So overall, again, less snowpack and mainly coming from uh, expected given the temperatures and, and reduced snowfall that we've seen across the region. Okay. So now we can go to soil moisture. Um, you know, the, what, what, what I'm showing you here on the left, this is really a depiction of, of, of two different model systems. On the left is uh, NOAA's uh, North American Land Aid Assimilation System, and on the right is NASA's List Sports System. And overall, the areas where we see the red colors, those are below average soil moisture in a zero to 40 inch column, uh, down to 40 inches. Green is where we have above average soil moisture. So, and this is shown as percentiles. So for example, the, the 10th percentile, we'd expect to hit the 10th percentile value one out of every 10 years or so. Um, and so, you know, the, the, although there are some differences in the Dakotas between the models, uh, we do see broad consistent patterns of below average soil moisture to very much depleted soils, um, all the way from Eastern Colorado up through Western Iowa. And then again, in the Corn Belt through Central Illinois, uh, Indiana and into, into Michigan here. The NASA sport models are a little bit drier, especially in parts of Kansas and Illinois. Uh, but again, we're, we're really seeing the pattern of just a dry end to 2020. And for some folks, a dry entirety of 2020 that has carried through this time of the year. And especially when we get west of the Mississippi River, our, our expectation for replenishing those depleted soils uh, um, in, in January and February is less and less. Uh, that, that it's not the time of the year that we would typically see ab abundant rainfall to replenish that soil. So a lot of these remnants here uh, have, have stuck around from, from last year's growing season. Just, I like this figure just to show you how, how far we've come, I suppose, in the last year. This is showing soil moisture as a one year change. And again, this is showing not the percentile, but the percent water content. I'll put that in perspective in just a second. So everywhere we have red to the gray colors, those are areas that we've seen a large decrease in soil moisture from, from uh, last year at this time to, to now. Uh, anywhere in green and blue, the, the small areas of the country we have those, that's where we've seen an increase. Um, in parts of Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, all the way up to the Dakotas, we have a large, we've had a large decrease of, of a loss of moisture out of those soils. And if you think about where we were last year, uh, last year I did the February webinar and, and I think I was plugging, flooding, flooding, flooding the whole time. Now I'm talking about drought and it's just how dry 2020 was um, and, uh, and, and how much water we've lost out of those soils. In some places where we have quite a bit of water holding capacity, out of that zero to 40 inch soil column, we've lost up to 10 to 15 inches of water just in the last year. Um, and so, um, you know, a, a lot of the, the cushion that we had coming into a, what was a dry 2020 um, is not there right now because our soil moisture is depleted. Uh, looking at stream flow, stream flow is a little bit less telling this time of year, especially as we go north and west, as we get ice that can, that can uh, mess with climatological stream flow numbers. Overall, what I wanted to uh, point your attention here to is in the southern and eastern part of the region. We have below average stream flow from eastern Kansas all the way through Illinois and Indiana into Ohio and Michigan. Um, and uh, again, uh, even down in this area, the Mid-South and the lower Ohio Valley, 
um, well, uh, below average to well below average stream flow. And just thinking about where we were last year when, when we had hundreds of gauges uh, in the Ohio and the upper Mississippi and the M Missouri basins uh, in flood stage or approaching flood stage. And actually at this point, we only have one gauge in the entire region that is uh, above flood stage. And that is the, um, the Jefferson River near Three Forks, Montana. Uh, there's been some ice jamming issues with that. I got this great picture from Gallatin County, uh, Montana, um, that, uh, that, that shows that, that, that ice jamming uh, occurring there. But overall, we're, we're seeing, especially again in the eastern part of the region, um, well below average, below average, well below average stream flow um, that, that is just reminiscent of those continuously dry conditions. Focusing on Missouri in particular, this showed the Missouri Main Stem River uh, system storage. So here we are right now in 2021, 56.2 million acre feet uh, compared to the green line of, of 2019. 2020 was something similar to that. Um, so, and, and these blue lines here are showing uh, the, the average, the maximum on top, and the minimum. So we're below where we were last year. That's not surprising in 2019. Uh, still uh, a decent amount above average as far as total system storage. Um, and certainly well above the, the climatological uh, minimum or the, the, uh, the record minimum for the Missouri system. So you know, overall, uh, you know, stream flow has responded to the dry conditions that ended 2020 and have begun this year, um, but we're not any, we're, we're, we're still actually above average as far as the system storage is concerned. Okay, so more to the point of drought, this is showing the newest uh, 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 map that was released today uh, from the U.S. Drought Monitor, I need to point your attention here that this is, although it was released today, it was current as of Tuesday, January 20 or 19th, um, and it's showing areas in the 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 uh, the most areas from the the Central Plains westward are still dealing with drought issues. 45% uh, of this entire area is in moderate drought or worse. Uh, some places uh, in Nebraska, uh, Colorado. Um, uh, Wyoming and, and parts of northwestern Iowa are still dealing with severe to uh, extreme or exceptional drought. Uh, a little bit better in the eastern, southeastern part of the region. Uh, this this uh, area of moderate drought to severe drought in Illinois and Indiana just keeps sticking around because we haven't gotten the, the moisture here that we need to replenish those soils to take care of that. Um, but yeah, overall at this point, because of that dry 2020 and the carryover to 2021, we're, we're still dealing with drought conditions at this point. Um, and uh, given the warm temperatures, as you say, mild temperatures for winter uh, so far, and uh, the fact that, that nobody is, is, is pushing the record books for precipitation uh, for winter in the region, we really haven't seen much improvement. To speak to that point, um, what I'm showing here is the change map in the U.S. Drought Monitor uh, between now and back in October, late October of 2020. Areas in green have, are where we've seen improvement by one category or more. Uh, areas in yellow and orange are where we've seen um, deterioration or worsening of drought conditions. So we have had some areas, southern Kansas, southwest Missouri, up into parts of Illinois and Indiana and, and across uh, Iowa that have improved uh, because we've even gotten a decent amount of snowfall or just rain has eroded some of those, uh, some of those soil moisture deficits. We've also had some areas though of, 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 of worsening of drought conditions um, or expansion of drought conditions in some cases in parts of Kansas and up into the Dakotas, Minnesota and, and Wisconsin. Uh, so overall, not a huge amount of change in the region uh, since the end of, of, of fall, beginning of winter as far as it's concerned. But, um, and that again is to be expected in, in, in most cases because this region is not going to, is typically not going to um, receive a tremendous amount of rainfall or precipitation or replenish those soils this time of the year. It's, it's typically a drier time of the year anyway. Uh, the, the newly released uh, seasonal drought outlook was released by the Climate Prediction Center earlier today. Um, this is valid from today through the end of April. Uh, this big block of brown here that we're showing from Western Iowa all the way through California, that is the area where the, the highest likelihood is drought persistence. So drought is currently present there, at least moderate drought, if not worse. And then the prediction is the highest probability of uh, drought persistence, at least through the end of April. The area of yellow here from Kansas down into Oklahoma is where the probabilities are leaning on drought development uh, in that region. And then uh, the only real areas where the probabilities are leading towards drought removal are here, that area of the, the Corn Belt that I mentioned before that's been persistent, as well as parts of uh, northern Minnesota and some parts of eastern Montana. But overall, the main pattern here is drought persistence 
in areas where we have drought right now, which again is, is, um, is uh, an important point to say that what we have right now as far as soil moisture deficits, things like that, the, the expectations here, the probabilities are leaning that those will exist going uh, at least through the end of winter, if not into spring. Um, switching gears a little bit now to the Great Lakes, uh, winter has been pretty warm uh, relative to climatology, and uh, we haven't really gotten a whole lot of those, those passing winter storms in this region. So uh, as we would expect, the Great Lakes temperatures remain uh, above normal uh, in response to that warm first half of winter, and ice cover in the Great Lakes is, um, is frankly puny. Uh, we have a total of 1.9% ice cover in the entire Great Lakes Basin. Uh, to give you an idea, we had 10% by this time in uh, last year, and even last year was below average, and 16% uh, by this time in uh, 2019. Uh, now, less ice cover does a couple of things. First of all, theoretically, less ice cover can allow for more lake evaporation, and that, that could actually be a good thing given that lake levels, as I'll show in a little bit, are still well above average, um, and we could use a little bit of evaporation of those lakes to get those uh, 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 high levels down. It can also, though, that reduced ice can uh, removes the buffer for lakeshore damage. And so if we do get winter storms uh, that, that uh, 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 can push up the water, it can increase the risk of shoreline damage because of the lack of ice cover. So it's a double-edged sword in that way. Um, I, I want to shout out to Aaron Wilson from the Ohio State Climatologist Office for giving me this, this figure here, just to show you the, how far we are behind. And in this case, it's Lake Erie. Uh, ice cover as a percent. This blue line here is the 1973 to 2020 average, and we're all the way down here. The black line uh, really barely shows up on the plot, less than 2% of total ice cover for Lake Erie. So well below average for this time of the year. And again, it, it's a direct result of just what's been a very warm end of fall and, and, and beginning of winter. Okay, so these charts are showing from the um, Army Corps of Engineers, the current and, and forecasted uh, lake levels uh, is starting with Lake Superior here. Um, the red line is where we're at coming from 2020 into 2021. The dashed blue line in each of these is our long-term average. And then the forecast here is, the, is the, uh, the, the vertical line area, the hash line area. And our records are these uh, horizontal bars here. So Lake, Lake Superior, you can see we, we got close to or broke a few records uh, at this time of the year last year. We're uh, somewhere in between record and average for this time of the year. So still above average, but not near record levels in Superior. And the forecasts uh, show that we're uh, expected to remain there throughout much of the year. So uh, the expectation here, and this is really the same pattern for all the lake basins, is not near record levels uh, like what we saw the last couple of years, but still above average levels, which again, increase that risk of, of shoreline erosion and issues from there. Here's Michigan Huron, kind of the same thing here, a little bit higher than Lake Superior relative to the average. Uh, the, the forecasts do encompass a, 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 a little bit of a higher area there, but still um, the, the main point here is that uh, despite having a dry 2020, um, you know, the fluctuations in lake levels are quite a bit longer than atmospheric variability. So, um, we, we, we would expect that the lakes are still responding to the very wet period that started a few years ago. And, and that's what we're seeing where those Great Lakes levels are still high. Uh, Lake Erie, same thing here, uh, where we're at versus where we're expected to go versus the normal. Um, and, uh, and Lake Ontario, kind of the same thing here. So, so again, Great Lakes levels uh, elevated. And again, the redu reduction of ice cover means that if we do get those winter storms in the Great Lakes areas, it increases the risk of, of that shoreline erosion and some damage there. Okay, so let's talk about impacts. Uh, I'm gonna start with Earth uh, here. This is a GOES 16 image from, from uh, Colorado State University that was put together. And uh, it's showing a dust storm uh, that picked up on January 15th from Eastern Colorado and blew across uh, Western Kansas and the panhandles of Oklahoma and, Te oh, Oklahoma and Texas there. Um, and you can see that that dust is carrying through here. And um, you know, this is just, again, a remnant of ongoing drought conditions in eastern Colorado, a typically dry time of the year anyway, and very strong winds. I'll talk about those winds in a little bit here. One thing I want to pick out your attention here, just for the, for the, the, the weather nerds on board here, is you can see these clouds swirling in this direction. This was on the backside of a large uh, trough uh, uh, that had pushed air in this direction, which is why we had such strong winds in this region. Uh, and uh, uh, the winds, as I'll show in a little bit, were not just really strong in eastern Colorado, but pretty much across the entire Plains region around this time period. 
Um, so we have the earth, now we have wind. A 90 plus mile per hour wind gusts were recorded from Wyoming to Iowa last week. So, so a large chunk of the central US. And um, as a Midwesterner, you know, even normal Great Plains winds uh, kind of eye popping to myself, but um, these are, are, are even anomalous uh, to, uh, relative to normal for the Great Plains. We can see this is the plot up here showing uh, wind speeds from the Cheyenne National Weather Service office, 105 mile per hour gusts at Warren Air Force Base. But again, not just the single gusts at one station, but how widespread and how many stations recorded wind gusts of 70, 80, in some cases, 90 miles per hour. Um, uh, the Ellsworth Air Force Base uh, station there in South Dakota had the, the highest, uh, or the second highest, excuse me, uh, average seven day wind speed between January 11th, and January 17th. That's what this plot shows here. The green bar from this year was about 17.8 miles per hour over a seven day period. And that's not gust, that's sustained winds of 17 miles per hour average. Um, and that was the second highest uh, on record there going all the way back to the 1940s. Um, and then just some pictures of impacts. This poor uh, fella here uh, was either trying to go on vacation or, or get somebody's camper to them and uh, caused some issues there. And then uh, just the, the, the bending of that sign. So quite a bit of, uh, of, of, um, of, uh, of wind from just this last this last week and across the Great Plains. Uh, to give you an idea of that spatial extent, I wanted to show a map here. Uh, what this map is showing, and the, the color coding here is showing the the seven day average wind speed anomaly. So this is in miles per hour, but this is this is anomalies. This is the the absolute wind speed. This area in the kind of lighter shade of blue is anywhere between three and and five miles per hour higher. Than, than average. And again, this is a windy windy part of the country and to have uh, sustained winds for seven days be three to five miles per hour higher. And then this, uh, this this green area here, we're talking eight to 12 miles per hour higher than average. Um, and so again, the impressive is just the, 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 the absolute value of the wind speeds, but also how large of an area they encompassed. It, it was just very, very windy that, that part of the country last week. Uh, and with, with, with wind, comes and dryness comes fire, even in January. Uh, we had the American Center fire in the Black Hills, which burned 50 acres, which is uh, the second largest December wildfire in the Black Hills since um, recordings back to 87. Very large wildfire uh, with evacuations from Bankelman, uh, Nebraska in the early morning of January 15th. I have the tweet down here from the Goodland office, the National Weather Service about that emergency evacuation. Um, and then uh, a large wildfire near the there to the South Dakota North Dakota border near Lemon, South Dakota, which started on January 14th. Uh, show an image here from the Perkins County Sheriff Office. Uh, an estimated near 20,000 acres burned from that grass fire. So um, uh, again, uh, really a result of ongoing drought conditions in this area, along with very very strong winds. And again, not just the gusts, but the sustained winds, which are really necessary to make that to make those fires spread so quickly. Uh, more specifically, agricultural impacts. We have some concerns about drought, of course, uh, carried over from 2020. Uh, the winter warmth and lack of snow uh, have, have increased soil evaporation, not, not to the point where we're deplenish, uh, deplenishing soil moisture uh, by quite a bit as we would in the summertime, but still the fact that we haven't gotten that snowpack and temperatures have been much above average this time of the year has increased that soil uh, uh, evaporation. The positive impacts of, of, of a warm winter so far is that it reduces feed needs for livestock and it's overall easier to get to the animals without that heavy snowpack. And the lack of precipitation um, and the typical dryness that, that's normal for this time of the year uh, is, uh, uh, makes uh, uh, less, can, less issues with mudding as well. Also reduction in fuel costs and heating needs because of, uh, of, of just overall warmer temperatures. However, mild winter temperatures does increase the risk of early green up and bud break, uh, which uh, risks uh, increase the risk of freeze damage to stone fruit, berries, perennials, overall specialty crops across the region. Um, as we've seen, uh, several species already reach their, uh, their, their uh, winter chill hours, the amount of winter chill hours they need to break um, uh, dormancy already this time of the year in the southern part of the Midwest. So that is a bit of a concern, as well as concern of winter week break, breaking dormancy in parts of, of Kansas and southern Illinois, for example, just because of how warm uh, the conditions have been. Other impacts we've seen, uh, thin lake ice, always an issue when, when we have a very warm winter. Folks and vehicles are fall, uh, falling through the ice in uh, reports in South Dakota and Minnesota, resulting in multiple depths. I, I attach here what I think is a really nice 
uh, a figure from the Green Bay National Weather Service office, uh, just kind of uh, showing the, the weight of the object on the ice versus the necessary required depth of the ice to, to make sure that uh, we don't have issues of falling through. Uh, at the same time, ice rinks in South Dakota have closed um, uh, more often because of, of warm weather, more often than usual. Other recreational impacts, snowmobiling activity uh, in the northern part of the region has been affected by a lack of snow cover, as has some ski resorts that are lacking snow. And then I mentioned before the ice jam jams in Montana that have that have been an issue for um, isolated uh, flooding, but still still an issue there. Okay, last piece is, are the outlooks looking forward here. First, starting with a short term seven day precipitation forecast this is from the, the National Weather Service. Uh, we're seeing here overall a forecasted wet week for most of the region, especially the eastern part of the region. Some uh, forecasted heavy rainfall here, uh, you know, anywhere between an inch and a half to, to three to four inches in some places of the of the mid south. Uh, for our region, uh, we have totals anywhere between uh, three quarters and one and a half inches for the southern part of the region. Uh, most of the area here in green we're seeing is anywhere between a quarter and a half an inch forecasted all the way from Ohio up to central uh, South Dakota. Uh, as we move west for parts of eastern Colorado, North Dakota, eastern Montana, uh, it's a dry week. It's forecasted for most of that region. The 8 to 14 day outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center are shown here that were just released uh, yesterday. Um, these are good from the 28th of this month through uh, February 3rd. So kind of that, that the last week of, of January, first week of February here. Uh, the red here on the left hand side for temperature just shows us that uh, there's elevated odds of warmer than normal pretty much everywhere across the region. The strongest odds are here in the, the kind of the southwest part of our region, as well as a small area here of elevated odds in the western uh, Great Lakes region. But overall, the expectation is for at least the rest of this month, beginning of February, is kind of business as usual, warmer than average conditions. Um, slightly higher odds of wetter the conditions here for precipitation, as you see the green on the right-hand side on the west side of the Great Lakes. Uh, the, the dipole of that, the opposite of that for the, the southwest part of the region in um, eastern Colorado, western Kansas is below average precipitation. Um, uh, especially for this area of the, of, of the Great Lakes, that, that, those odds are, they're pretty weakly elevated, uh, which means there's a little bit more uncertainty there, as well as it's, it's always important to mention that this is a climatologically a dry time of the year. So even wetter than normal doesn't necessarily mean a, a tremendous amount of precipitation. Uh, for, for February outlooks, your outlooks for February as a month total, we have, again, temperature, elevated odds of warmer than normal conditions, all but pretty much the northern plains. Um, and then when we look at precipitation, what are the normal conditions? This is, this is kind of leaning into those La Nina-like conditions a little bit more here. Uh, what are the normal conditions from the Ohio Valley up through the Great Lakes? Uh, slightly elevated odds of drier than normal, but, but equal chance for most of the central and, and western parts of our region. Here, so so that that's uh, kind of again similar to what we saw in January, February, looking in in this direction with a warmer and and and, and slightly elevated odds of, of above average precipitation for parts of the region. Seasonal outlook again very very similar, even leaning more into that La Nina uh, kicking in uh, later on in the in the late winter, early spring. Those elevated odds of warmer than normal conditions virtually everywhere here uh, across our region. Um, and uh, drier than normal in the, again, in the, in the plains, you can see uh, for, for February, March, and April put together, it's a little bit stronger odds of drier than normal conditions in the southern plains and the central plains here uh, versus February as a whole. Um, again, this, this Ohio Valley signal that comes uh, from a typical La Nina winter or spring, um, above average precipitation there. Uh, so, so, so pretty similar to our, our month of February as a whole. And as we go out to March, April, May, our final seasonal outlook, again, it's very similar. Uh, I feel like a broken record. Warmer than average conditions across much of the region or uh, elevated odds of warmer than normal conditions across the region. Um, and then again, dry to, this, to the west, uh, wetter in the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes region for that, uh, that climatological spring period. Um, as is a surprise to nobody, we are uh, still in La Nina conditions in the, in the equatorial Pacific. Um, these are showing the probabilities uh, of, uh, of, of ENSO phases going all the way out to uh, the uh, um, middle to later part of this year. So it's greater than 50% probability of La Nina persisting into spring. That's a slightly elevated blue bar here for March and April and May. As we move from spring into summer, we get these higher odds of transition from La Nina to ENSO neutral. Um, 
And then there is this, this uh, as we get out to August, September, October period, there is this small signal of potential La Nina reemergence next fall. However, we're quite a ways away from that period of time. Um, and you can see that, that none of these uh, probabilities reach above that 50% mark. So uh, still a lot to, to be seen before that time. But the big thing here, I think, is, is uh, that higher probability of La Nina at least continuing through spring. And, and one more thing I'd, I'd like to just add on to that trend is that <clears throat> it's not all that unusual. I found this out yesterday and others probably should have told me. But anyway, it's not unusual to have um, what we call a double dip for La Nina. In other words, a La Nina year like this going into another one. Now, the second one usually is a little weaker, but that's all. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, wrap things up. Winter has been drier and warmer than normal across the region. Um, we still have that considerable soil moisture deficit in parts uh, throughout most of the plains, parts of Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana that have carried from 2020. Uh, to put it in numbers, 82% of the high plains region, 11% of the Midwest regions remain in at least moderate drought, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor. As far as the Great Lakes are concerned, we have that reduced ice cover and above average levels, not as close to record levels as last year, but still the potential to create some damage, especially as we get more a more active storm track, if we get a more active storm track across that region. Uh, the snowpack is below average, below normal in most regions, uh, including um, in the, uh, the, kind of the, the, the headwaters in Missouri, 50 to 80% of, of normal in those regions. Um, when we're looking out, the short-term outlook, much the same. Warmth continues, not a whole lot of opportunity uh, for so much to recharge, especially in the plains. Longer term outlook kind of locks that in. Uh, uh, there may be a little bit of a La Nina signal kicking in in the outlooks uh, for, for later in the winter, early in spring. Continued higher odds of warm and normal conditions across the, most of the region, but a little bit of a stronger odds for wet east, dry west uh, that is emerging from February, March, and April. And again, just more concern of that drop persistence into the spring in the plains, given current conditions in the outlooks. So with that, uh, just a, uh, some, some further information as far as the partners. I want to thank our, our partners um, for all their help with, with uh, having me put this together and um, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Trent. Uh, we do have a few questions and, oh, about 10 minutes or so. So uh, one of the first ones, is it, thoughts on the warm temperatures so far, even with La Nina going on, which is not, especially in the Northern Plains, not a, what you would consider a typical reflection of La Nina. Also the dryness, um, one could also add to that, uh, maybe not a reflection in the North uh, being relatively dry. And um, so the question is what's going on with La Nina and why isn't it impacting us as much as it could be or has in the past. So, um, Dennis, do you want to do you want to start on that, or should I? Or Trent? You, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll defer on this one. Okay. Well, there, you know, it's 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 not cut and dry. Uh, one thing we're not seeing is a direct uh, line to uh, of storms, if you will, coming in through. Uh, uh, they're being, if nothing else, the cold air is being pinned to the north for a lot of reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of that is a relatively strong jet stream that is, is keeping things uh, to the north mm -hmm. and not allowing ar Arctic air. And uh, really, we haven't seen much Arctic air um, <laughs> since October, which is pretty odd uh, in and of itself. But uh, we haven't seen any Arctic plunges, if you will. We see cold fronts come through, and things do get colder from time to time. But really, those temperatures are not um, not extreme in any way whatsoever. In fact, uh, they're still above normal in many cases. Doug, Doug I will I will Go chime ahead. in on one thing. I, a graphic I shared with you folks earlier that showed global temperatures or northern hemisphere temperatures oh, yeah. Yeah. since and in in January, and that not only us but up over the pole is well above average. So the only really place where there's much cold has been over parts of Asia. So it's it's really hard to get cold here when there's not any not that much cold to the north of us. Right, right, right. Canada's not cold. Now we've had some cold in Alaska. We're going to have some cold in the western U.S. Uh, I think later this week. Is that right? Um, or, or yeah, or early next week. 
um, but it's not necessarily going to translate to our area. We've even had other indicators, what we call the uh, Arctic Oscillation and the North Atlantic Oscillation. Those things have been indicating that we should be getting or could be getting colder as well. Um, but uh, but again, we're not tapping the, the Arctic the Arctic air as uh, at all. Really, uh, we're getting Pacific air, if you will. It's the Pacific air masses in here uh, mm -hmm. rather than those. Um, so so why La Nina isn't behaving? Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about La Nina behaving or not behaving is that there is a propensity for La Ninas to kick in later in the winter. In other words, we start seeing that pattern of cooler and wetter north, uh, drier and warmer to the south, or yeah, drier and warmer to the south, um, 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 February, March, and, and, and even in, into April sometimes. So we'll see if that happens this year, and uh, and see if see if we can verify some of those outlooks that we've they've provided. Um, in some ways, this has been a kind of a flip flop, but generally just warm, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, Okay, Dennis. I know you. Uh, I know you. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, well, Dennis. I know you addressed this uh, to uh, the person who asked the question, but just generally, are there concerns about winter wheat due to fluctuating soil temperatures and or dryness? Probably not, not talking about high plains here. Yeah, high plains winter wheat. Not so much uh, fluctuating soil temperatures or cold air temperatures because we simply haven't had that that, that much cold like we just addressed. Uh, certainly, there was concern about winter wheat due to the plant, the dry conditions when planted. Uh, there were uneven stands developed, and then uh, and then uh, Trent brought up the you know this overall warmth we've had and potential that this warmth could allow dormancy break for uh, winter wheat earlier than it should be. And if you would get a freeze, uh, even an average freeze with an early dormancy break, we could still do some damage. So not as much soil temperature, but definitely dryness and potential for early dormancy break. Yep. And going on, uh, the next question by the same person was really, what is the dominant teleconnection impact in the drier forecast for the growing season? Uh, and I think what you mean by that is the growing season in the high plains. Uh, it, because that's where that's where it was from Texas up to Nebraska-ish area. Um, that that dominant teleconnection in the outlooks is directly from um, a La Nina. It's a La Nina signature. So that's what we would expect. There is a tendency to be dry in the in the plains. Okay, um, Bryce, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, the uh, the inevitable question, and I'm glad you asked it, but I'm going to say it's inevitable anyway, is the comparisons to 2012 and uh, potential drought. And I, and a couple things I'll say, and then I know Dennis and, and maybe Trent have something to say about this as well, but um, w a lot of people have been fielding this question because it has been warm, um, and we have seen... Um, unusual amounts of evaporation and lack of, if you will, um, really precipitation through the fall, most places, and, and, and now into the winter so far. Remember 2012 was, yes, 2012 was, was similar to that. And uh, 2012 also had a, several weeks in March of, of 80 plus degrees. <laughs> which uh, blew us out of the water. And um, if you want to talk about evaporation, that was a lot. Um, and then Dennis just mentioned um, um, coming out of dormancy and all those issues. And we had some problems like that in 2012. Also in 2007, for those of you who remember, a very warm late winter, early spring, and then a plunge back to normal to, uh, in that case, it was uh, well below normal in 2007, uh, temperatures in early April, which did a lot of damage. But Dennis, comparisons or Trent, comparisons to 2012, anything you want to, to, to say right now? Trent, do you want to say anything? Uh, other than what Doug had mentioned, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the important part that not, not all the, uh, other than just having La Nina in the, in the equatorial Pacific, the North Pacific looks a decent amount different right now than it did in 2012. So, um, and, and really when we get into the summertime, how, how, 
the tropical Pacific uh, kind of uh, works through the North Pacific is really important for the summer and, and it's not shaping up like a 2012, for example. Um, so yeah, I, it, it is really difficult to compare conditions from one uh, drought year to another uh, drought year. And so I, yeah, I, I would say that there's not any sort of uh, concern about having another 2012. It's, it's just really not only too early, but I, I would say it's, it's not really a fair comparison right now. Dennis? I, you know, I, I think the only thing that I would say is if you're in a very dry soil area right now, I would be at some level of increased concern, not 2012 comparison, but some level of increased, in, increased concern. Uh, if your soils are in pretty good shape, I wouldn't sweat things too much at this point. Okay. Um, what, do I have anything else to say? There's another question here that's kind of along these same lines. How much concern <laughs> should we have about the lack of moisture in the Western Corn Belt, uh, threatening trend lines for corn and soybeans this year? And I think we've sum summed that up pretty well. It's definitely worth watching. It's not like we're going into it with an abundance of soil moisture like we were last year, which saved our bacon in a lot of places, right? Um, anything you want to say about that, Dennis and or Trent? Um, I'd say the one thing you got you got to consider where you are. If if you are in a place where irrigation is available, they will probably have not as much concern unless we got into serious drought conditions. Uh, anything dry land in the plains, yeah, then we, we should really take note of anything that is in dry land. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, back to the polar vortex and such. Uh, uh, there has been media attention, or well, certainly has been in the past years to the polar vortex, but, but, uh, but our information that we're showing today and have been showing doesn't really, we haven't mentioned it much. Um, there was some media attention recently, and the reality was uh, we call it stratospheric warming and um, and a different sort of polar vortex up much higher than the <laughs> lower polar vortex, which we don't want to get into on this call. But uh, of that, perhaps shifting things around such that we do start getting some Arctic outbreaks in this area. Uh, so far, even though that has happened, like Dennis said earlier, much of the cold air has been, if you will, settling uh, over Eurasia and, and basically Central, Central, Central Asia as opposed to, uh, to to our side of the hemisphere, if you will. And these things, um, I'm not sure how, how those get predicted very well, but that's what's happening this year. So there is cold air out there. It's just on the other side of the globe. Um, yeah. Um, let me get see if there's any other oh, no worries from frost heaving in winter wheat uh, Hans is commenting <laughs> do you want to say anything about that Dennis um, no I think that's it I mean that's we're good good point not, not 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 much frost to speak of so and in fact I just received a uh, an email from one of our, our partners in 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 South Dakota Aberdeen is the lowest or the the shallowest frost depth in seven years okay okay so an interesting question um thank you anna for the question uh should there be uh, a relatively high precipitation event or two over the next few months um, how capable of soils uh to hold that precipitation and do you think it would resort in some amount of flooding and again it really depends on where um, that happens and if that precipitation event is snow or rain and if it's warm I mean, if the conditions remain warm and we start getting rain um, in places that we don't normally and, and, and the ground is frozen, even though it's uh, above normal, it still can be frozen, uh, uh, we could have, we definitely could have flooding. And, and we actually expect some spring flooding no matter what. No matter what the year, we do expect some on more or less tributaries to the major rivers, okay, especially in the eastern uh, let's say east of the Missouri or east of the Miss east of the Mississippi. In some cases, you noticed on those outlook maps that there were higher probabilities of above normal precipitation in the Ohio Valley and Southern Great Lakes and sort of eastern or sort sort of the midwestern area. Um, all those areas could certainly flood, or could have some some level of flooding. 
you know, I'm, I'm not going to go out and say what's going to happen because I have no idea. But what I would say is those soils, though, aren't amazingly wet right now. Not like, well, remember, last year, everything was wet and couldn't hold a lot of, of water. So it didn't take that much. Um, Dennis, any more on that or Trent, any more you want to say about heavy precipitation events? I, 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 I think you got it. That. And any time of, of a, you know, if, if you get into a three, four, five inch rainfall event, you're going to have flooding. It doesn't matter what your soil condition is. But, you know, a, a two or three inch rainfall event with very dry soils, that's going to limit the, the problems you're going to have versus a two to three inch soil event or rainfall event. You, you got to think back to like the, the, the big storm that kicked off the flooding back in 2019. We had two or three inches of rain in March. That would have caused a little bit of flooding, but that fell on top of snow and frozen ground. So, you know, what, yeah. what surface that is falling into and the condition of that surface make a lot of difference as to whether you have flooding or just, you know, generalized wetness. I'll also remind folks in 2019, we went, we were having a relatively warm 2019 early winter and things slipped on us in mid to late January where things got drastically colder uh, and everything froze up. And then we kept getting precipitation events over and over and over again. And finally a big precipitation event in mid-March, mid which uh, caused a lot of the problems. So uh, again, certainly I'm not predicting that, but just that's, that was the setup in that year, 2019. Um, two more things and then we'll, uh, I think we'll be done here. Um, Oh, three more things and then we'll be done here. Uh, question about, can we draw any lines uh, between global warming and this, this uh, lack of typical La Nina response? And I, um, that's an that's a interesting question. Our, our history of, of, of sort of watching El Nino and La Nina is pretty short in time. So we don't have a great climatology of that. Uh, there are indications that, whether it's climate change or not, that the impact on the northern hemisphere or uh, North America due to El Nino and La Nina may be changing over time to some degree. Uh, you know, as temperatures continue to warm, right? Um, maybe we're not going to see as, as many drastically cold uh, outbreaks um, during La Ninas. That would be that would be something you, you might be able to derive um, uh, along those lines. But uh, it's tough to pin. Uh, climate change on, uh, on on the warmth, for example, this this winter. However, uh, another another thing that I think Trent showed was that trend line in soil temperatures. That is a that's not just another indicator of, of of changes that we're seeing. But anybody else? Go ahead. Dennis, I know you want to comment. All right. I the the only other thing I would I would add to that is the, the lack of cold must have some connection to lack of ice up over the pole. Uh, you know, we're seeing shrinking in the, in the polar ice coverage area. There has to be some relationships with, with lack of overall cold there too. So uh, do we, does anybody want to comment on the polar vortex and the uh, possibilities for a northern, for the northern plains winter right now uh, and and this is from Jerry and uh, either Dennis uh, probably Dennis you can take that offline later <laughs> if you want if you want to otherwise you know I, it's always I would say it's always there uh, but you know your sometimes your best forecast is persistence in other words what you what we had this last month may be our best forecast for what's going to happen the next month it's not always works but Certainly, as it has been the trend this winter, uh, for us to be sort of relatively mild, uh, I, I would expect still a couple ar Arctic outbreaks, of, you know, some dips in that jet stream, sometime between now and uh, April for sure. Anybody else want to comment? All right. And then the final thing is, can you go back to slide? Oh, she left. <laughs> It's gonna it's gonna have Wendy's. Uh, oh well, we can get to to Wendy's question later. But it was really a question about how the Aussie was built, and uh, the categories. Um, what categories went into it, and and 
yeah, what, what the elevations of the stations are specifically in Wyoming. But I think we're going to have to address that offline because that's pretty specific. Um, that is the end of our questions. If if you have any other questions, you see our contact information there, Doug, Dennis, Trent, and other folks there who know a lot of stuff that we don't, um, are all contactable, uh, either an email. Uh, so if you have any other questions, please uh, send them to us. Thank you very much. I'm going to call this uh, over. And uh, uh, thanks, Trent and Dennis, for your help this month. And we will talk to you next month. All right. Take care.